first asked me with a rather bland kind of subject, and somehow he manoeuvred me into talking about, uh, 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 after the Synod wrote, what next for the Church of England, which is a, a subject on which there's really no neutral ground. So I will speak, and then we will have uh, an open discussion about it, which I'm very much looking forward to. Let me start off with a poll which I've just commissioned for a series of debates that we're holding in London called the Westminster Faith Debates, and they're an attempt to uh, discuss religion in public and raise the level of conversation in society about religion, which, as you all know, um, can be rather simplistic. This year we are debating issues around personal morality. And I was very interested to commission a survey to see um, the range of religious and secular opinion on a range of controversial issues, starting off with abortion and running through the whole life course and ending up with euthanasia. We're, we're just starting off now at the moment. <coughs> if I go through and analyse it, I'm going through week by week, and I've just been, this is hot off, hot off the press, I've just been looking at the figures for the debate we've got next week, which is about women uh, and gender difference in religion. The figures are really quite shocking, they surprised me. One of the questions we asked was um, how much approval there is for the Church of England's current policies on women. 8% of the population express approval of the Church of England's policies, 8%. If you ask those who don't affiliate with religion, it falls to 3% of the population. That's a shockingly low level of approval for where the Church of England currently is on women. What about Anglicans? It's hardly different. 11% of Anglicans approve of the Church of England's policies on women. 11%. Those are nominal Anglicans, people who call themselves Anglicans when asked, are you Anglican Catholic, Christian, whatever. If you look at practicing Anglicans, it only goes up to 16% the approval rate. So there's overwhelming disapproval for where the Church of England is today on women amongst Anglicans and amongst the population. Another question we asked was, do you think religions would be better off with more women leaders, e.g. female bishops, <coughs> chief rabbis, etc.? Large majorities think that they would. Even Muslims, who have the smallest majority, are nevertheless overall pro greater female leadership. Who's against it? Five percent of Anglicans are against having more women. Ten percent of Catholics. Slightly more Baptists, but not many actually. Who are they? Who are the small number who think religions would be worse off with women leaders? We did some analysis a couple of days ago to see what the factors are which determine to be opposed to women leadership. The determining factors, the only ones that have any significance, nothing to do with political attitudes or age or any of that, the determining factors are being male and whether you draw most guidance from religious authority. We've got one question that says, where do you get your authority living your life from? Is it your own reason and judgment? Is it your own intuition? Is it friends? Is it family? Is it God? Is it scripture? Is it religious, religious authorities? <coughs> Those who say religious authorities uh, are, are, the, are that's one of the turning factors in those who are less approved of women leadership. But the numbers are tiny. The numbers are still tiny. So here's an issue in which the Church of England's policies are clearly massively out of step with where most Anglicans are and where the general population is. It's not the only issue in which they're out of step. <coughs> and this is surprising because if we go back not very long in history, to the late 50s, the 1960s, for example, that early post 
post-war period, the Church of England was actually not yet was actually leading opinion on moral issues. It was ahead of the state, for example, on liberalisation of divorce law and liberalisation of the law on homosexuality. The Wolfenden report, which recommended decriminalising homosexual behaviour and recommended that homosexual behaviour between consenting adults in private should no longer be a criminal offence, had on it Canon de Matt, a senior Anglican clergyman who was very important in pushing that report and eventually changing state legislation in a liberal direction towards homosexuality, an inclusive direction. And similarly, the Church of England, um, under Archbishop Ramsey, commissioned the report Putting Asunder, some of you might remember, in 1966, on marriage and divorce, uh, which pushed forward liberalisation of divorce. So the Church hasn't always been opposed to the, the, the moral consensus, the consensus of the majority in this country. On the contrary, it's sometimes, not that long ago, been leading in This raises the questions that I want to address tonight. I think there are three. Number one, how, when and why did this disjunction with wider opinion, secular and religious, come about? Number two, does it matter, or is it right, that the Church of, the Church of England should be taking a stand against opinion on a number of issues at this point in history? And number three, what happens next? Where do we go next? It's part of what Chris has, has uh, asked me to address. So, first question. How, when, and why did this disjunction happen? I'm going to keep coming back to a date which I think is really important for religious change in this country, and that's 1989. In 1989, something really quite dramatic happened, I think, and I'll start to kind of flesh that out throughout my talk. But how, when, and why did we actually see the Church of England um, <coughs> really, really coming adrift from where a lot of people were? Um, maybe some people would say it came some years after 92 when women were ordained and people thought bishops will come quickly and it didn't. Some people would say 2003, which was when Rowan Williams uh, wouldn't appoint Geoffrey John as Bishop of Reading. Sometime around then, uh, in the 90s, it became much clearer that the Church of England was taking a stance against general opinion. You know, opinion on um, approval of um, civil partnerships first and gay marriage has gone up and up and up. It's dramatic um, social and moral change. The Church of England, uh, it became clear quite early on, wasn't going to go along with that, with that change. Why? Why? That's a very big question, which no one has actually yet answered. Partly because not many people study the Church of England, interestingly. The Church doesn't study itself. The Church of England is a very research-averse church. It doesn't have big research departments. It doesn't like letting people in to study it, I know from experience. <laughs> <laughs> I studied the Church of England, but I, I used to work for the Church of England for some time, and I was the age of five, so I studied Church of England at the age of five because I went to a Church of England primary school from, from then onwards. Um, but it's hard to get commissioned to study it and its decision making structures and so on. But let's have a go. Let's have a go at an answer as to why this disjunction has occurred. And of course, as with all significant social phenomena, there are a lot of answers. It's overdetermined. But let's let me go through what I think are some of the reasons, and we can discuss, uh, I'm sure I'll miss some, we can discuss others. And as I do that, let me just um, note that we're not just talking about the Church of England, let's, let's just broaden it a little bit, and there's an interesting comparison, for example, we made with the Roman Catholic Church, which has a, been travelling in a similar direction, actually, over a rather similar period. Uh, I was 
um, talking on a program on Radio 4, they recorded this morning about uh, Gillespie, Gillespie Coin, what were they called? Gillespie Coin something. Those architects who designed wonderful churches in Scotland in the 50s, Roman Catholic churches. And I dug out this quote for it. It was Pope John XXIII in 1962 opening the Second Vatican Council. And listen to him, listen to what he says, and think of the church, the Roman Catholic Church now. He says, We feel we must disagree with those prophets of gloom who are always forecasting disaster as though the end of the world were at hand. In the present order of things, 1962, divine providence is leading us to a new order of human relations which, by men's own efforts and even beyond their very expectations, are directed toward the fulfillment of God's superior and inscrutable designs. And everything, even human differences, leads to the greater good of the church. So a complete embrace of the progress of society and the church seeing itself as at the heart of change, not opposing it, but at the heart of it. These churches I'm talking about in the 50s and 60s, that wave of church building, at the heart of the new towns, at the heart of new estates across the UK. The church is absolutely part of the new welfare society, um, seeing themselves not as opposed to where society was going, but throwing their lot in with it, Catholic and and both of them, in some ways, were trenched. So why? Let's see some possible answers. Well, one has to do, I think, with the creation of the welfare state and what that did to the Church of England. The welfare state began with huge enthusiasm, uh, slightly before the Second World War ended, but brought, brought real birth after the Second World War, was a project in which the Church of England was absolutely central. The church is, it's impossible without the churches, particularly the Church of England. The church literally gave resources, and it gave its hospitals, it gave its personnel, it gave material resources to the welfare state project. But it also gave an ideology, and a lot of the architects, um, like Beveridge, and inspirers like Tawney, were devout Anglicans. And they thought that a welfare society with a more equal society was the fulfilment of a Christian ideal. And that by handing over education and hospitals and welfare, a number of functions that the churches had performed for centuries, they could be performed for everyone more professionally, more equitably, <coughs> more efficiently. So the churches are part of our, of our welfare state. <laughs> In some ways, that has not served the Church of England well, despite the very extremely noble uh, intentions. Because the welfare state and society secularised, and people really forgot about the Christian gift to it, and came to see it as a secular project, and a lot of the professions, whether that's nursing, education, medical, whatever, secularised, often became quite hostile to religion. So the church gave a lot, it's not clear exactly what it ended up with. The Catholic Church, which was always much more suspicious of the welfare project, it was, for example, much less willing to give its schools over to the state, so it maintained you know, voluntary control, maintained more control and still does of both Catholic schools and Anglican schools. It wanted to preserve its distinctiveness more, it didn't want to be quite so swallowed up by the state. And maybe that served it a little, bit, a little bit better. I'll come back to that point. So a welfare bargain, part of the issue. Number two, um, this is a problem, what's happening to the Church of England, which is actually shared as well by many national churches, state churches, churches of the Reformation that grew up along with the state. If you look at the Scandinavian churches, uh, some, they have also suffered serious decline. And they also have quite similar problems about what their identity is today. And that's partly to do with um, having a clear national ethnic identity which religion undergirds, like Anglicanism, which is partly an ethnic identity, being English. So for what are you, English? Well, I must be C of E. That's a problem when you start getting a much more multicultural society and you don't have one church and one state and one nation in the same way. So that's been a problem. 
and th there's, a, there's a serious debate now amongst people who think that we are still a national church, a church for everyone, as the parish system uh, also dictates, and those who think it should be a distinctive ecclesia in a called out of the world, maintaining its integrity over against society. We might be more likely to call now for disestablishment of the church. The church doesn't really know where, where it is. It's leadership anyway, central leadership. Thirdly, um, the Church of England, I think, got stuck in time. It got stuck at a particular point. It got stuck in that welfare mentality, the 50s, 60s mentality and class structure and mentality. Because partly, uh, this is very controversial, partly it got stuck in a certain sort of paternalism which has to do with both gender and class. The Church of England, and this part of its welfare project, was very good at looking after the poor and women, but it was a paternalistic mode of looking after. If you read, as I've done, parish magazines from the 70s, even the early 80s, the tone is it's quite embarrassing. It's like watching television ads. You couldn't speak to women like that anymore. You couldn't speak to the poor like that anymore. Society's equalised quite significantly since then. I think the last, it's often seen as really progressive, but I think the last symptom of this, and where the church really got stuck, was Faith in the City. The Faith in the City Report, 1985, commissioned by Archbishop Grunty, which still had that mentality of looking after the poor in the, in the inner city. And women weren't really, didn't really figure in, in, that, in that view. And that was very much the ethos of the whole Anglo-Catholic movement, which has collapsed dramatically since that point. Partly because it was in working class areas, we've had a very paternalistic view, I think, part of, that's part of its collapse. Why that, why we've moved on, why that's a stuck in timeless, the church can't quite move from that mentality, why we've moved so far is that there's been massive social change from the late 80s. The, the massification of higher education, you know, getting on for half the population with a higher education now, and the entrance of women into the labour force and into the professions. These are huge, unprecedented historical changes that have happened incredibly quickly. So the church, even if it got stuck not that long ago, things have moved incredibly quickly since that point, and the church hasn't kept up with those changes. Fourthly, and this is linked, there's been a failure to laicize, to really involve lay people. Actually, the Church of England has become increasingly centralized, I'm not sure clericalized is the right word, maybe episcopalized. Uh, there's a difference between Catholics and Anglicans. There's a big division in, in, in Catholicism, the division is between the laity and clergy and bishops. In Anglicanism, I always think, the, 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 the fault line is different. It's, it's the laity and the clergy and bishops. It's a different, different fault line. And the bishops have increasingly centralised power, tried to change structures in a way that has done that. That's part of the backstory of what happened over the ordination of the Women bishops vote. It's partly on opposition to the way the bishops are behaving on, on, on both parties. Now, just to um, it, illustrate this historically, if you think back to the creation of Synod, how that happened was um, it was a state and it is a state church. Parliament, as you know, made decisions for the church because it was a church of the people of this country, so it would be appropriate that Parliament made decisions. And in many ways that was a democratic um, way of proceeding. If it's the church of the people, the Parliament's democratically elected, appropriate that the people should have a say through Parliament. The church, um, particularly from the beginning of the 20th century, wanted, it was starting to seem anachronistic for that have to happen, the church wanted more autonomy. And Parliament in general, public opinion, gradually came round to that, and a council gradually became a synod. 
But there was a, there's a very significant debate about what the constitution of Synod would be and how it would operate. And there's a forgotten part in that story where some people, in my view quite rightly, said that lay people ought to have you know, one man, one vote. Why not actually have lay people elect their lay representatives in Synod? The bishops didn't want it. They didn't trust lay people. There were lots of arguments about why lay people were not really qualified to actually make decisions for the benefit of the church. And that's why we ended up with that bizarre, that one removed democracy where you vote for deanery representatives and uh, you don't necessarily end up with a representative house of merit. It goes back to that failure to really democratise a long time ago. Again, absolutely part of the background to the vote on women bishops. And to my answering my question, why does this tiny, tiny minority, why is its voice determining the policy of the church? These things often go back to quite abstruse, long ago, legal and constitutional decisions. Very significant ones. So a failure to lay aside. As I said, you get more and more highly educated lay people in all walks of life, you know, parliamentarians, journalists, whatever. The church doesn't use them. It's a massive failure of the church in England. The Roman Catholic Church would be much better. It's not that it uses them, it's that there are so few clergy in the Catholic Church, it can't help it. So lay Catholics just do their own thing. You know, they run the news, they run the tablet, the Catholic Herald, they are prominent in Parliament, they have their own voice, they can't be stopped. But there's still enough clergy of clerical and fiscal control in the Church of England that you can't really do anything unless you're ordained. If you want to do anything in the Church of England, you have to be ordained or go on some course. Partly why I'm not particularly bothered about the ordination of women, actually. I think it's in many ways been a retrograde step for the Church of England because it's silenced the, this whole debate and it stopped a, 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 an active debate. Fifthly, um, and I touched on this, but this is more about theology, really. Uh, there's been a collapse and a real failure of liberals and of anti Catholics and of their theology. I mean, a failure to really um, have conviction in their own beliefs and ideas, to communicate them effectively. Academic theology is sort of cut adrift from the churches, it becomes something just that academics talking to other academics. There aren't the popular theologians widely read that there used to be. There's not a, a level of um, public theology and discussion that there used to be. And the level of theology, I was originally trained in theology, is terrible. If you listen to the ordination of women bishops debate, it's hair-raisingly bad theology if you're trained in theology. Something's gone wrong, we've lost our theological tradition. People aren't aware of it anymore. There are so many parts of it that people 1,500 years of it that seem to not be not, not be lying anymore. And that makes it very easy for some people to say this is what the tradition really says and not be contradicted in that. Maybe there's a failure of general um, Anglican education somewhere. Sixthly, um, the best organised groups have been the most conservative ones. They have not only been able to put together very effective networks, mobilise opinion, get the voice out into the public sphere, but also to ally globally with people of similar view and to make this extremely strong moral stand against where the rest of society is going. Most notably, of course, over the issue of homosexuality, and that's still running. And part of what that's done is to use up the energy of leadership in constantly dealing with that problem. When you're looking over your shoulder and fighting that battle the whole time, you don't have a lot of energy for new vision and uh, exciting, uh, adventurous, uh, confident initiatives. But nevertheless, and finally, I think my 
final point. I do think there's been a failure of leadership, a very serious failure of leadership of the Church of England. And a dishonest. I mean, to be, to be honest, the Church of England has always been, very significantly, a church of women and homosexual people. That's its history. Women disproportionately represented. As far as we've got record, which is back to the 19th century, women outnumbering men by a ratio of about three to two, and being more active at every level of church life, except for leadership from which they're excluded. And very significant numbers of gay men right throughout the church and in positions of considerable leadership and putting huge energy into the church. So it's bizarre that the church should have had such trouble being honest about this and acknowledging the role of women and of gay people, and still does. <coughs> there's a very narrow, um, in the leadership, in the Episcopacy, there's a very, very narrow um, kind of moral range of what you can be. I looked at the candidacy statement for the Archbishop of Canterbury, a job I've done. <laughs> Is steady. 
the Catholics have got a much clearer sense of their identity and keeping that identity. And this is partly, going back to my earlier points, because it's very hard to maintain a national ethnic identity, a majority identity. Minorities always find it easier to maintain their identities. Catholics are still minorities in this country. And they have a stronger sense of their identity, and they're better in their schools at continuing to produce Catholics. There was a survey of a Church of England school which showed that if you go to the Church of England school, you're more likely at the end to come out secular than when you went in. So they actually secularised people. Whereas Church of Catholic schools produce more Catholics than went in. It also matters because the Church of England is not just a state church, it's a society church. It's a very particular kind of church. So how can you have a church that wants to be still the state church that is, and a society church that is out of step with society? It doesn't make sense. A state, the best a state church can be is the place where a society holds up before itself its better self, you know, its vision of what it should be. And Anglicanism did that. That's what I love about Anglicanism. It's, it held up an ideal of decency and fairness and generosity. All those things that we hope are part of being English, being Anglican. It holds up a vision of your better self to the majority of people. That's what a church is. Let me go back to my intellectual hero, who is Ernst Trotsch, who is the great founder of sociology of Christianity. And he made this distinction that's in our language now between a church and a sect. And he showed how a lot of Christianity, the preferred one actually mysticism, like Quakers, but Christianity basically falls into the church type and the sectarian type, the sect type. The church, like the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, thinks that the whole of society is God's and therefore it wants to bring in the whole of society. And it will compromise to do that, because it believes that everyone is God's child. The sect, much more typical of Protestant groups, wants to be obedient and truthful to the strenuous message of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, and it thinks you separate yourself off from society in order to do that. You become pure. In order to maintain the purity of your moral life, and the absurd difficulty of Jesus' teaching, you must cut yourself off from society. They're both perfectly legitimate Christian positions, but the Church of England isn't historically a sect. It's a church. Its parish system is like that. Its whole, uh, its whole theology is like that. And yet it's put itself in a position of a sect. Sects define their boundaries through moralism, through saying only those who live this kind of pure moral life are us. That's not where the Church of England has been in its history, and yet it's where it has ended up now. <coughs> but you can't have the privileges of a state church, a society church, and turn your back on the people who give you those privileges. I think that's why there was that real outpouring of anger on the part of Parliament and people at the Synod decision. It was a betrayal. Finally, and briefly, and we'll talk more together, where next? Well, first of all, I think we need to be much more honest. I think the Church of England is a horribly dishonest church that doesn't call a spade a spade. And it's very dishonest about some of the issues that I've been talking about. And it's extremely dishonest about the seriousness of its problems. I think its leadership have got their head in the sand. I know. I've tried. You can give statistics. I mean, my poll is 4,000 people. No, it can't. It's not true. There must be some problem. <laughs> Secondly, the situation that that survey I've just shown you, talked to you about, um, reveals is that the vast majority of Anglicans have absolutely no voice at the moment. No voice in church, no voice in society. The voice has been hijacked by an unrepresentative minority who have a perfectly legitimate view and a perfectly legitimate voice and a perfectly legitimate claim to be treated decently, but they're a small minority. So the majority needs somehow, the, the leadership needs to speak for the majority again. Also, the 
majority needs to have a real say. Let's go back to one person, one vote, for the laity, why not? And make people feel they've got a stake in their church and its decisions. And use lay people, use lay people in all walks of life to help the church in its current mess get out of it. We also need a renewed vision. We need a renewed vision of who God is, how decisions are made, where authority lies, what it is to be English, generous, again. Okay. And a renewed theology has to be part of that. There's very little sense, I think, people find it hard to articulate what it is to be Anglican at the moment, and that's a serious problem. There needs to be organisational change and a rationalisation of resources with shrinking numbers and shrinking resources, a crunch is about to come, and change is not being managed. There's no serious imaginative management of change. Church of Wales will be much more imaginative about how you will have to reorganise parishes. <coughs> Church of England is ducking that challenge. You have to put an end to paternalism, and it's still there in spades in the Church of England. And you have to give the minority voice their due and no more, not the disproportionate representation that they've been getting at the moment from a weak and worrying leadership. And I'm going to stop there, Chris, and have some discussion. <laughs> So the question is where to start in terms of some of, of these issues that are raised. Does anybody really want to come back to Lynn and have the opportunity Please to... Please argue and disagree. Don't be shy. Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I really enjoyed that. One of the things I've been doing for the last ten years is sitting on the Church Commissioners Committee looking at the future of redundant churches. And I, one as well as have been batting our heads against the wall, trying to persuade them to do some research at future potential scenario as to where we might be. Uh, without any success at all, I mean, I can empathise with what you, you have said, that you just don't like the idea. But what reads and, and hears the, the, the incredible continuing decline, yet since the 19, late 1970s when the first of the series of Charlie County, we're only closing about 20 churches a year. And one feels that there is a precipice there, but the, but the precipice never seems to come. And part of the message centrally from the organisation is that the precipice isn't going to come. And if we've got, what is it, got to 16,000 churches, and we're actually only losing 20 a year, and in the meantime creating one or two new ones, Things may carry on. I, I see that aging populations things they won't. And I just wondered if you had a view <coughs> of where that precipice might be, if in fact it exists. Uh, on the churches in particular, or the finances in general? Well, I think the, the two go together. You know, the, the congregation dies, the building <coughs> dies eventually. Mm. Um, I mean, it's been delayed for the church in the way it hasn't for lots of other churches on buildings because they're ancient and beautiful buildings that people in communities love and are prepared to put a lot of effort into keeping open. Uh, you know, if you look at a lot of the non-conformist churches, they, no one loved them, they weren't a break there, they weren't listed. They, so it would be much more obvious for having to close with them. So a lot of these are kept together by small groups of people uh, managing to do that and by stretching charitable resources more and more and more. Um, and by um, various grant giving bodies that help with some of the maintenance issues and by the church's cost subsidies. Um, but something will, will give them at some point. I don't know the finances, so I can't say at what point or what will facilitate it, but uh, I would guess that it will. And there's no plan for how that's going to happen and what role they're going to serve. What do you mean thinking about the issue? I'm sure someone clever could tell you when that precipice will come and what it will be and what happens, but uh, there's a sort of thinking, you can understand
understand it. I hear it a lot from uh, Catholic leaders. We've been here 2,000 years. Yes, it's a crisis. We've had lots of crises. We'll get through it like we got through it more. But something new has happened. You know, there weren't an educated, there wasn't an educated laity before. There weren't educated women. That is completely historically new. So I'm not sure that that sense of real weather fit is actually very well grounded. Further questions? At, at the back there. Yes? Thank you. Um, thanks for a really, really interesting talk. Um, could I just clarify, when you contrasted the term church and tech, yeah. I did a study more years ago than I get to mention. Would that correlate with the old distinction of denomination and tech? No. Um, denomination. A denomination was a, I'm going to have a social religion lecture now, sorry. <laughs> denomination was a modification of Trolch's scheme by Niva, uh, who saw that in, America, in the USA a, a completely new type of Christian organisation had grown up. Um, so it wasn't a section, it wasn't a church, it was something different. Because the church was universal, it, in, in the nature of church it wanted to embrace the whole of society. Whereas non-nations were quite happy to say we will just have the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians, but they weren't set either. So they're a third kind of piece. I was interested in the distinction you drew between, in the Anglican Church between uh, laity and clergy and then bishops. You didn't mention church civil servants because I think they are the most powerful people in the church because bishops actually don't serve very long. Uh, the civil servants are there longer than most of the bishops are. Just wonder if you comment on that. But secondly, about this question of the minority, um, the tiny minority uh, getting it, its say. In the vote in November, as, as I'm sure most people here are aware, there were people who, though in, in favour of the principle of women bishops, voted against women bishops because they wanted to keep a broad Church of England. I wonder if you could say something about whether the Church of England should be a broad church with different views on gay issues and with women bishops and so on, or is it going to be as the Bishop of Durham, the former Bishop of Durham, not no, the one before last, <laughs> uh, Tom Wright, that you could believe anything you like in the Church of England about the resurrection, atonement, sin, and all the rest of it, as long as you believed in the ordination of women. You had to be pure on that issue. Uh, is there still a room for breadth of opinion? Should there be room for breadth of opinion on that issue? Mm. Certainly, of course there should. Uh, everyone's opinions on that should be respected and valid. Um, but it's not for 
Uh, and as I said, the ordination of women isn't, I don't think it's a significant issue for the future of the church, one way or another, nor the ordination of women bishops, actually. I think the issue is how you use your laity, how they have real power alongside and with the clergy and even over, over bishops and clergy when they have greater expertise. That's the issue. And just ordaining everyone is just deepening the problem of clericalisation. That's not so as against ordination of women, I wasn't. I thought it was a hopeful thing, but actually I think it's been a, re a retrograde step for the Church of England, uh, for the reasons I said. The, church, the Catholic Church, by not ordaining women, has maintained a much more powerful impetus amongst lay people for change and for active involvement, <coughs> and, and resisted the, the clericalisation that the Church is suffering from. So there's nothing about being broad that's happening in the last few decades. It's narrowed and narrowed. So fewer and fewer people feel they have a home in the church. That's what the figures are showing at the moment. We don't have a broad church in the way we once did, but people more generally feel they are part of it. Any further questions? Um, I'm not a vicar or a theologian, but I am a bit of a feminist. <laughs> and if I understood what you said earlier on correctly about the ordination of women priests actually hiding the prob hiding women's voices yeah. and women's voices not being heard, then I am all for women bishops. But surely, if women the Act for Women Bishops does pass, will that not do the same with the fact that um, religious organisations are excluded from the Equality Act? So, I'm all for women bishops, yeah, yeah. but if um, it's passed that we can have women bishops, then um, it will hide the issue that women aren't seen as equal um, because religious organisations are ex exempt in the Equality Act. Right, okay. Um, so, I think you're partly agreeing with what I'm saying, which yeah. is that um, women bishops are not part of the Equality Act. The, the way the church treats women hasn't changed the ordination of women, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm saying, and this, this again... And that, oh. even that won't necessarily change that. Yeah. And if you look at women, but I did some analysis on the figures of where women, ordained women, are in the Church of England, and they are disproportionately, and compared with men, things are absolutely shocking, not paid, mm -hmm. NSM, <laughs> or in poor and difficult parishes. So the ordination women hasn't put them in an equal position at all. And presumably ordination women bishops will end up doing something quite similar. Yeah. So it's not really addressed the problem of structural inequality. Uh, and it's closed down on a really active lay women movement pushing for, for more change in, in the church. Have you any thoughts on how um, we people at lay level can do something about this structural inequality or what may need to happen? Revolution. Can I just tell one anecdote which I, I do know to be true? Long, many years ago, when the House of Bishops couldn't decide how to proceed with women bishops, what form the legislation should be, they had a meeting in Leeds and couldn't come to any conclusion. That's perfectly respectable. But minutes of that meeting with action points were uh, written on the train back to King's Cross by a senior civil servant. And that is the process that we then started, which got us into the mess that we're now in. It was the civil servant's fault. <laughs> well, um, I can only quote um, uh, the Westminster Faith Debates I organise, I do with Charles Clark, who's at Lancaster University now as an honorary professor, he used to be Home Secretary, and we were doing a debate um, just at the time of the, the women bishops vote, um, and one of the bishops was there, I thought to remain nameless, and he was saying something about this, and Charles said, what possible, how can a politician ever blame civil servants for if you're an organised politician, those are your servants, that's the whole point. So it's not good enough to push the problem on, on in that way. You can't pass that buck. 
nor can you blame the staff of church house to oppress people. But, you know, a, a leader is a leader and, and makes sure that those things aren't happening. At the back, John. Linda, as Chris said, you've given us a huge range of issues to think about, and it's going to be difficult uh, to recall them all. Uh, but one part where I think I lost your thread of argument was you were saying on the one hand, there was the schism which had the bishops on one side and the clergy and the laity on the other. And yet later in your discussion you were saying, which I think followed really the argument you were making later, the schism really between the laity on one side and the bishops and clergy on the other. And that was certainly the case in the vote. Yes, it was in the vote. But, 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 and, and, yeah. and, and the schism between bishops and clergy on one hand and laity on the other would be uh, consistent with what you were saying about laity being uh, an intelligent laity not fitting in <laughs> to the church structure. But the perhaps the laity doesn't represent the laity. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. ah. That's what my figures show. The, 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 the house of laity is oh, the only filter with where the lay Africans actually are. That's that's the that's the real problem okay. in that. Yes, in that. But I think you're partly I mean just to, just to you, you were sorry, um, interpreting me right then. But I think I think the clergy therefore have this difficult role. Between the laity and the bishops. Mm. It's a very difficult role that the clergy has to play. So what schism is not the word I use. No. No. So, so what you're saying really is that the house of the laity isn't representative of the church on the last hour. Well, it's become, the church has become less and less a church of lay people. Yeah. Part of its beauty is that it's a lay church. So as a lay leader, the monarch is the leader of the Church of England, uh, and it was run by laity, by parliament. It was a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a lay church. And that's been rolled back and back and back and back. Thank you. Peter and Matt, your point about uh, theology resonates with me and probably with Hillary and the White Wives thinking questions. You've got a bad cough, but... Uh, <laughs> um, we've got experience, perhaps, and usually we, we were at the Kevin Christian in the Conservative Evangelical Church kind of move, we've got feet in several camps. And what I would say, I've generalised, I've interested whether other people recognise this. If you go to a typical Anglican evangelical church, my experience is that if you talk to people, people know much more about what they believe and why. They train and that they're taught particular. It's a coherent kind of package about male headship, etc., creative norms, etc. And, I'm a, and a large group will understand that. And then a lot of younger people come and it, it's, it's, it's a coherent whole. Yeah. I think in the, more, uh, the middle of the road, the other parts of the Anglican Church, I suspect that's not the case. And people are much more reluctant, perhaps not equipped, to talk yeah. about you know, how they explain their instincts. And I think that's a real issue. But in, in the, yeah. in the our, our daughter is in there, thriving conservative church, I think, charismatic church in, uh, in down south. Yes. And the, the difference is striking. Yes. And I think that accounts to the part yes. why the minority perhaps have the same. Yes. They are better educated, yes. theologically better, more committed. <coughs> uh, you're absolutely spot on, I think. Um, you know, and that's Sorry, part that was part of, of the <laughs> <laughs> But that's actually part of it's very important to understand that. that part of the success of evangelicalism and of a more fundamentalist tendency is its ability to have a very simple message be clearly conveyed, and that's its origin. The fundamentalism started in, in Christianity in the 1920s, and the book The Fundamentals, those pamphlets, were sponsored by an advertising magnet who saw that Christianity needs to use the tools of modern advertising. And it's a simple, simple message, easily and quickly communicated, like adverts. And that's what fundamentalism is. It's, it's a modern movement that's very able to give a clear message. And that's very successful. But it's not necessarily very successful for nurturing people for the whole life of faith. And there's a lot of throughput from a lot of evangelical churches. People don't stay in them for life. And a lot of people look for something more when they come out of the other side. But you're right that 
um, non-evangelicals have been very bad at equipping people with, with anything, really. I mean, the Catholic Church has been better. The Catholic Catechism, the modern Catechism, is very good in many ways. Uh, I mean, that's an answer. When we're trying to do these debates in London, we try and get a rep, you know, many of the spokespeople of religion, various religions and denominations as we can. It's in the easiest. We have to keep saying, no, not another Catholic. Because there are any number of articulate Catholic, just think how many well-known figures there are in public life, Catholic spokespeople, journalists, politicians, no problem getting a Catholic to speak about their faith or general issues. Try and find Anglicans. Far more Anglicans in this country. But can you think of an Anglican journalist? If people don't have that sense of identity, they can't articulate their Anglicanism in their way of life in the, in the same way, even though they're highly intelligent people. Um, and, uh, well, I'll tell you another anecdote. I did a lot of interviewing for a big project in Kendall. I found all the different churches and all the religious groups. And there's a really huge difference. If you were, I mean, the most extreme would be um, Christadelphians or Jehovah's Witnesses or those sorts of churches. And then interviewing people were very boring because they'd all say exactly the same thing because they knew by rote almost what they believed. You know, what do you believe? And you'd have exactly the same thing. You speak to someone else exactly the same. It, it was more formulaic than speaking from their own experience or their heart. The exact opposite was the main parish church. And when I asked the vicar for access there, he said, oh, um, yes, you can interview people, but try not to ask them what they believe, because it really upsets them. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, the issues that, that, that's been coming out here is, is, in a sense, the difference between where the laity are coming from and where the clergy bishops are coming from. And one of our speakers recently really raised the issue of the feminism and the whole human rights equality agenda, which the theologians would say, no, that's not the language we speak. We have to speak the gospel language, understand human responsibilities, not human rights. If we're going to empower more laity with the one person, one vote, will that bring much more of the equality of human rights language into our theological discourse in how we may take things forward? Not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily. Although it's an exemplification of, uh, of an opening up to more people and inclusiveness, but it doesn't mean you're going to adopt those language or terms. Nor do you need to necessarily. The tradition's got its own resources. Um, but, um, I'm sorry, I was going to say something else about your first point. Um, Say something else because I'll remember what my point was going to be. Repeat it again. It <laughs> <laughs> was a good point. I don't want to lose it. I, I, I wish I could remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I find myself um, a, a great deal in, ah, uh, in different yes. camps, yes. speaking to uh, gay activist groups, for example, and right. speaking to them from a religious point of view, trying to explain where the theology comes from and, and how we can address the issues theologically. And, and it's this mismatch between people speaking two languages to each other. The religious group is speaking a, a, a language which yeah. is entrenched in the Old Testament yeah. and, and Pauline theology, yeah. where well, people are coming from a completely right. different point of view. And that's, and that's a terrible problem. And those languages will never meet, and one feels they're being more Christian than the other, and it just exacerbates the problem. So the solution isn't there. It's more about if you have, that, if you have real inclusivity, uh, in practice, you're modeling. A different authority in theology. Because the Church of England just recently has become incredibly bibliocentric in a way it never was. That means the Bible becomes everything. That's not the church tradition. There is nothing traditional about saying that the Bible is the sole authority of Anglican. Anglican has three or four authorities in its tradition, as you know. You know, we have a hooker or the land of the natural, and at, at least it has tradition, Bible, and reason or the people. And all those together are how you form good judgments. <coughs> I mean, just look back, I mean, temple, for example. It's the people of God who make the decision. The Spirit speaks through the people of God. Uh, we are all children of God. You get proper theological decisions through more inclusive discussion of them. It's not about 
saying there's a proof text in the Bible. It's about knowing the Bible and being open to it, but also the whole of tradition and genuine and generous open discussion between as many people as possible. It's a completely different way of proceeding, and it's traditional. There's nothing traditional about the way the Bible's been used in that debate at the moment. So neither of the camps you talk about are being traditional. And there's a proper Anglican way of reasoning that is much more traditional and would avoid that kind of position, which we somehow move away from. That makes sense. It, it, it does, and I wonder whether or not that may, may be that it is the civil servants who are bringing a new language, that the civil servants speak, um, to, to dominate the discussion the way things are Don't be worried about compliance with the report. Well, not that worried about compliance with the report, because I've got exemptions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've been um, involved in the church life professionally since the, the late 70s, and, and, and since that time, there has been an obsession with, with women and with sexuality. And, and I, I just worry that if we were to take those two subjects out of the discussion, we wouldn't know how to do what we were really supposed to do. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine a church where we have got beyond these discussions, agreed to disagree, and actually moved forward? How would that help? To, to, to move forward and be the Church of England again, if we could do that. I, I suppose a way of answering that is to say, where, where do you already see that? You know, don't be too pessimistic. There are parts of the Church of England that are growing and thriving and doing well, and for whom that doesn't seem to be an agenda anymore. Um, there are um, some congregations doing that. There are some fresh expressions of churches doing that. There are some wonderful social churches <coughs> doing that. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not a blanket picture, but you're right, that's using up so much energy at the moment that it's stopping, it's stopping the spirit, it's stopping that kind of growth. For what? Back to the audience. At the front. Um, I just wondered if, um, as a, a, a priest serving in a poor and difficult parish, as, as you put it, and very happily so, because of some things I believe about um, Jesus always being at the edge. I wonder if you could say something about the um, holding together of being the church which is the voice of the nation, but also maintaining that voice of prophecy, which isn't necessarily um, um, bound up with things like promotion and and uh, success and, and all those sorts of things which are coming down from on high more and more now as being this is what we all believe when actually we don't. No, and that's what the Church of England was wonderful at actually, I think. You know, it did have a vision of the edge, as we say, being really significant. When I went to my uh, very rural Somerset primary school at the age of five, there were, it was run by, women used to have much more in a way, I think, more place in the church. It was run by some very, very powerful Anglican women who preached the gospel to us. But looking back on it, they, they only had a very limited stock of Bible study, the Bible story, and they told them again and again in assemblies. They had five hymns they could play, and they had about ten Bible stories. <laughs> we thought it was children, it was from the recycle, it was very lovely and familiar. And looking back on it, the Bible studies they picked, they weren't anything about being good children, they were the boy Samuel being called by God, and they were Zachariah being called down from the tree by Jesus. And they were all about the child or the outsider is actually really important to God, it's actually at the centre of things. And the worldly authorities aren't where it's at. And that was absolutely the message of Anglicanism that I got, and it was absolutely inspired. I've never, never lost that. And that there are some things that are worth dying for that are much more important than worldly. Stuff.